Um, hi, I'm Jeffrey Lewis. We are at my apartment on East 4th Street in Manhattan, uh, which is uh, like five blocks from where I grew up and one block from where my parents live. So I've, uh, I'm 38 years old. I've never gone anywhere. That's not entirely true. I've gone to Brooklyn, but uh, now I'm back in Manhattan. So this is my, this is my Space Age bachelor pad. Um, where uh, the plants just keep on dying because I'm like such a loser. And I just keep buying new plants, but it's kind of like buying a bouquet of flowers. Like, all right, you buy it, it dies, and next week you go buy another one. Why, you know? Um, so yeah, that's my meager plant collection. Here's um, a friend of mine turned me on to this idea that like, you chop up, you get a cheapo calendar and you chop it up, and that way you can plan your, you see the whole year, ahead of you. Um, so I haven't actually filled anything out. I have a tour starting on the 21st of January, but I need to write the dates in. And it's just kind of like an interesting way to like schedule out, you know, tours and festivals and when, you know, when I might want to have a comic book out if, as if I was that organized. Um, this is um, Lou Reed collaged on top of the Terminator. I made that back in the 90s. My brother and I are big Lou Reed fans. I, I have like every Lou Reed record ever including all the live ones and everything. And um, we had this Terminator poster on our wall from when we were like kids. And then at some point, Lou Reed was on the cover of Time Out New York and there were posters for that issue at newsstands. And I like stole a poster from this newsstand on First Avenue. And I don't even remember if I had the idea that it would go perfectly on top of the Terminator when I got it, but it's such a perfect collage, like the neck, um, everything about it is just fits perfectly and um, the weird thing of it is his expression like when I'm writing songs sometimes I'll kind of like look up and see if he approves and his, his expression does seem to change incrementally depending on like what how quickly you look at it and like what his what his mood is and what your mood is and the way that I usually sum him up is like right, right now he looks grumpy actually but um, it's like uh, sometimes he seems so happy, sometimes he seems so sad, but mostly I just make him mad. And that's really like what he looks like. Because it's like the, almost the hint of a smile. Sometimes he kind of like gives me a little smile. Um, and, oh, and then next to Lou, there's, uh, there's Alan Moore on the cover of this British newspaper. Um, so Alan's another big hero of mine. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? Oh, I've got... Um, Oh, we could we could do that scene from Fargo where I like, run at you. Uh, this is uh, my dad got me this because um, I I, uh, I do chop some wood sometimes, not in New York, but I keep forgetting that that's there. I need to take that up to the country. Um, let's see. Well, here's an old world tour piano that I bought when I was 16, uh, which I never play anymore. I basically just use it as a shelf for art supplies. So this is like, this functions as my shelf. Uh, I've usually got, you know, all my art implements and I work on my comic books here on my desk. And then, similar to how I have Lou staring at me when I'm writing songs, I've got uh, my Daniel Klaus book staring at me judgmentally while I'm drawing comics because Klaus is like the greatest ever. Uh, and so I have that sort of propped up here to make sure that I work harder. And um, here's a stack of Casio SK-1s. I've actually got uh, over, over here. Um, I've got about six or seven Casio SK-1s in the house because every time I take them on tour I break them. I just bought a new one off of eBay that should be arriving any day now. Um, so usually, sometimes the stack is higher or sometimes it's lower. My closets also have a number of SK-1s in them. Um, and Records, of course, I'm a total record nerd. Um, here are some of my most prized, prized rare records. Okay, this one maybe takes the cake. This is um, the original first Fugs album on the original broadside label. This is very rare because it was quick, very soon after they, they issued this, it came out on ESP Records called the Fugs First Album. Um, but the original edition on uh, Broadside is the rare, I mean they're both rare, but this is like really rare, and um, it's, uh, 
It doesn't have the booklet, but sort of um, somewhere in here. Oh yeah, there it is. There's actually a, a lock of Tuli Kuferberg's hair. That's kind of it's a little creepy, a little ghoulish. Um, but um, at Tuli's funeral, his girlfriend Thelma was giving out locks of his hair, and I thought I can't think of where else to put that other than in the original Fuzz record. Crazy thing about this record, I bought this on St. Mark's Place from that guy who sells records on the street, or he used to, on St. Mark's Place. I don't think he knew that it was an original copy, because he was selling it for $15. That's insane. Um, I think he must have thought it was a reissue, because it has this weird cover that you never see. And the Fugs played so many concerts on St. Mark's Place in 1965, when this record first came out. I think this record did not leave St. Mark's Place for 40 years between like somebody buying it at a Fugs concert in 1965 on St. Mark's Place and then me buying it on the street on St. Mark's Place like 40 years later. Um, but it's come to a good home. Another favorite uh, most prized record that also was only found because of geographical circumstances is uh, my original international artist's copy of uh, <clears throat> the Golden Dawn Power Plant LP, which I bought in Austin, Texas for a mere $12.99, which is a hell of a find. Um, it's a wonderful album, and uh, I love the fact that it's all kind of beat up. Uh, I'm such a pervert, I, I have to smell my records half the time. The Sound Exchange record store does not even exist anymore, which is really a tragedy, but I love that I still have that price tag on there. That's the record store that has the big Daniel Johnston mural on the wall. The mural was preserved, but the store itself, unfortunately, is no longer there. I bought this in, uh, in uh, 2000 or 2001, I think I have the receipt in here somewhere. January 14th, 2001. That was, right now, it is January 2014. I'm bad at math, but somebody else can figure out how shockingly long ago it was that I got that. Ugh, I can't think about it. Um, my other, probably my other most prized vinyl possessions, I can't even believe I own these. Um, Original editions of the first two West Coast Pomp Art Experimental Band records. This is possibly, to me, the most beautiful album cover of all time. Ugh. I gotta, I'm just gonna... When I got these, when I got these, um... I, I didn't even, like, when I got them home, I bought them on eBay. Because I have a rule to never spend more than $15 on a record. That's my maximum. Like, basically, I've almost, almost never broken that rule. So I actually scored these for less than $15 each on eBay as a, as a batch. And I got them home from the, from the post office. I just like sat with tears in my eyes just, just sniffing them for a while before I even put them on the turntable. I had to just like sit at the table and smell them. And I also, I don't like to put the really, sp I, I love to like, it's, it, you know, it's kind of like, you know, unprotected sex or something. It's like I don't put the sleeves on them so I can like actually feel the real records. I'm such a nerd. I'm such a loser. Uh, at least I'm not talking about X-Men comics. I've got an X-Men comic collection, too. But that's back at my parents' place, because I haven't cared about X-Men comics since, like, 1991. Um, anyway, I'll stop talking about records. I'll show you... Um, I'll show you some other stuff. Okay, there's, a, there's some comic books. Oh, okay, ROM. This is, this is kind of special. There's ROM. Uh, Rom Space Knight, Marvel comic character, uh, was kind of got me into, got me into comic books, um, when I was, like, four years old. Rom was the one character that I really loved, and every time I do a sketchbook, oh, okay, I'll show you my sketchbooks, that's, that's the next important thing. Um, okay, so here's my hallway, turn the light on. There's my bathroom. Here's my here's my room. Um, here's a whole bunch of sketchbooks. Um, every sketchbook. You have enough light? I'll turn more light on. Um, 
every sketchbook that I have always starts with a drawing of me and Rom together. This is a sketchbook from uh, 1998. And um, so there's me and Rom. And uh, I'll show you some other ones. Here's one going back to uh, 1995, and there's uh, my weird interpretation of me and, and Rom, I guess. Um, maybe this is not such a great example, but I'll show you some other ones. Here's, here's a sketchbook from 1996, and there's, uh, there's Rom again. But I started getting better, let's see, well, by 1999 I was getting better. So there's, uh, there's me and Rom in, oh, this is 1998. Okay, there's me and Rom in 1998. And... Modern ones. Here's... Oh, there's there's a good one from uh, 2008 to 2009. Uh, so I've I've got dozens of these, and there's a lot of other stuff in the sketchbooks. A lot I draw people on the subway a lot. Um, there's a poster I did for Doofus, um, and more. Uh, there's a comic I did for the New York Times. Um, weird sketches. I very rarely work in color, but once in a while I'll do some color stuff. Um, so sometimes I'll start drawing somebody on the subway and then they move before I finish drawing them, so then I fill the rest of it out just with like weird nonsense. Uh, let's see. Uh, Alright, so anyway, there's a lot of, uh, like this one, there's like they start out as people on the subway, but then I have to fill it, finish it off with like weird monster stuff. And then every sketchbook I finish, I always end each sketchbook with uh, self-portraits. So every sketchbook starts with ROM and ends with self-portraits, just so I can kind of track my own continuing degradation and uh, disintegration into a, into a weird old loser. And... And then ideas. I always write down, like, anytime I have ideas for song lyrics or for comic book stories or for anything, I always jot them down in the backs of my sketchbooks. So, um... That's just stupid stuff, uh... And it's not even worth repeating. Uh, okay, here's more records. Oh boy, more records. Here's my... Here's my Lou Reed collection. Um, this is all... That's all Lou Reed records. Um, and most of this stuff is like psychedelic stuff. There's like a bunch of punk... There's some punk stuff. These are all like pebbles and back from the grave garage rock compilations. This is all like 60s folk stuff. I have like every Tim Buckley record, every Phil Oaks record, tons of like Tom Paxton, Dave Van Ronk, that sort of stuff. But a lot of this is, um, is 60s psychedelic stuff. Um, somewhat organized into, you know, like here's my Boston psychedelic stuff. So I've got uh, the Beacon Street Union and... Uh, Here's a great record, uh, The Ill Wind. Very glad to own a copy of that. Um, Ultimate Spinach. Like, this is all the Boston psychedelic stuff in one section. Um, and then all the San Francisco stuff, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, all right, I said I wasn't going to talk about records more. More comic book stuff. Here's, um, oh, okay, so I'll show you some more special comic book stuff. Look, 
Oh, here's another, uh, here's another SK-1. Um, in here, I have um, every single, every Alan Moore issue of Swamp Thing, um, including Swamp Thing number 20, which has never been reprinted. It was Alan Moore's first issue. And then, of course, 21, which is like the classic. And all of these are autographed by the artists. Um, not autographed by Alan Moore, but um, so I've got those are special Swamp Thing issues, and also every original uh, Alan Moore Miracle Man issue, which are way out of print and very hard to lay your hands on nowadays. All these old Miracle Man issues, which I was buying, uh, you know, back uh, reading them essentially before. Um, when it was just a comic, you would just go into a comic store and buy, and they're so incredibly awesome. Uh, there's number 15, which is like a particularly prized, rare one. Um, okay, so I'm a total Alan Moore fan, and then, also very special, every issue of 8-Ball, a.k.a. greatest comic book of all time, um, I've got every original issue of 8-Ball here, which you can't even find um, in the reprinted editions. I'm always complaining that like 8-Ball, you, now, you, nowadays all they sell is the collection. So you buy your collection of Ghost World, you buy your collection of Velvet Glove. Um, but that's like, what if, um, you know, what if Saturday Night Live was only available and a DVD of like, oh, here's two hours worth of Church Lady. Here's two hours worth of uh, Weekend Update. That's not the way it's supposed to be experienced. Like, every issue of 8-Ball had all these different crazy stories in them. And every issue, when it, like, was better than the last one, um, it's so... Gr of course, everybody fetishizes, like, their own, you know, teens and early 20s when, like, art would really blow your mind. Um, and then you get increasingly jaded as you get older. But... Um, 8-Ball was really, I mean, it, was I just at the right age, or is it actually the greatest thing ever? Uh, it's probably, it's kind of like the greatest comic ever. Um, yeah, there's 8-Ball, um, and finally, um, after wanting it my entire life, I'm not a toy nerd, I will admit to being a record nerd and a comic nerd to some extent. I don't give a flying fuck about toys at all. I don't, like, care about Star Wars toys. I don't care about any of that stuff. I don't care about fucking Spawn figures. I'm not, uh, I, you know, I look down my nose. Those are the nerds that nerds like us look down our nose at. Um, but Rom, like, this, I wanted this since I was, like, four years old. I, I was, like, I remember going to, like, Woolworths or wherever the heck you used to go in New York City in like 1979, 1980, 1981, trying to find this toy, which totally flopped. The comic book like actually went on for a few years, but the toy came and went. And because it is actually kind of stupid. And finally I bought it on eBay uh, just like a year ago. So I finally own the ROM toy, which is like the only thing that I wanted my entire life since my youth. So now I, I might as well just die. Um, but it's it's a really stupid toy, but it like, have this weird, unpredictable impact on my life because I don't—I wouldn't have gotten into like comic books and drawing without Rom. Um, 